Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Careers in Conservation webinar. Uh, I say our because we have folks from all different conservation organizations, different conservation groups uh, across Connecticut and uh, beyond. So my name is Sharon. I'm going to be your MC for tonight's webinar. And I am actually in conservation communications. So I'm doing a lot of writing, video production, email, social media, brochures, you name it, uh, support, in support of our conservation work. And uh, I work at Audubon. If I didn't say that, we are a conservation organization that protects birds and the places they need. Um, so very briefly, you get 10 seconds each. Introduce yourself, the organization that you work for, and, uh, and you know what you do in 10 seconds. And we'll start with Megan, Megan Munley. Hi, my name is Megan. Um, I'm in my early 20s, so I'm pretty new to working full time. Uh, and I work for Audubon. I have a bachelor's in environmental studies and I work under Sharon as a communications intern. Thanks. Ken Elkins. Hi there, I'm Ken Elkins. I'm the community conservation manager for Audubon, Connecticut and Audubon, New York. And I'm based in Southbury, Connecticut. Andrew Major. Hi, my name is Andrew Major, but most people call me Drew. I'm an environmental toxicologist for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I work out of our New England field office in Concord, or yeah, Concord, New Hampshire. Diana Wilson. Uh, I'm Diana. I am a public programs coordinator, but basically an environmental educator. Uh, and communicator down at an Audubon Center on Long Island, New York. So just across the sound. Rick Potvin. Hi, my name is Rick Potvin. I'm the refuge manager of Stewart B. McKinney National Wildlife at Refuge and Great Thicket National Wildlife Refuge in Southeast Connecticut. Lori. Hi all, I'm Corey Folsom O'Keefe. I'm the Director of Bird Conservation for Audubon, Connecticut, and I uh, do a lot of work uh, protecting our uh, coastal nesting birds. Thanks, Corey. How about Lori now? <laughs> I'm Lori Monroe Holtman, and I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm a public affairs specialist, so I do a lot of outreach to the public and do education and a lot of writing like blog posts and news releases. I work in Western Massachusetts in our Northeast region office. Shelby Casas. Hi, I'm Shelby Casas. I uh, work for Audubon, Connecticut, New York. I'm based out of Oyster Bay and I'm the Coastal Program Associate here. Uh, but prior to this, I worked with Corey uh, on the other side of the sound in Connecticut. Allison. Hi everyone, I'm Allison uh, Lucas. I oversee the science department at Stratford High School. Thanks Allison. Jim. Hi, I'm Jim Turek. I, uh, I work for NOAA, uh, which is a federal agency. Uh, I work for the Restoration Center. I'm a restoration ecologist and I work out of Narragansett, Rhode Island. And Robert LaFrance, we're doing a quick introduction, your name and, and where you work and just very briefly what you work on. Uh, Robert LaFrance, I am the policy director for Audubon, Connecticut, which means I do a lot of the policy and political work for uh, Audubon. So how we're going to do this, because there are so many of us, because there are so many different types of careers in conservation, is we're going to have just a couple of folks answering each question that I ask. So as a reminder, you're just going to use the raise hand emoji if you have an absolutely excellent answer to the question that I pose. Um, so the first question is, of course, we're going to take, we're going to go back in time and we'd love to hear how you found your way to the position in conservation that you are in today. So if you could just share a little about your professional journey. And we'll see who the brave soul is to raise their hand to go first. And you know what, just, oh, great, Megan, go ahead. 
I'll go. So um, like I mentioned, I'm in my early 20s. So I'm a bit new to professional career and being out of college. Um, so I actually started college in engineering. So my biggest takeaway, if anything, is you can absolutely love something and you might go to college for one thing and you might even graduate with a degree, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be doing it for the rest of your life. Um, so I just knew I love science and I took as many electives in college as I could um, of like biological courses and different science courses. And I did a lot with that and kind of talked to my professors. And then when I graduated, I went on to kind of teaching. I did some stuff in finance and then I found my way to Audubon and I absolutely love it. So it's been a couple of years since I've been out of college. Um, and I just took internships and jobs that I thought were interesting, even if they were kind of part-time or if I wasn't sure, you know, if they were only going for three or three months at a time and they were kind of short-term stuff. And I dipped my toes into as much as I could and got a lot of experience in different areas like teaching, um, engineering, finances, and I just, loved conservation so much and Audubon's a really great organization. So it's kind of where I got today and it's been a little mashup and my resume looks a little bit silly, um, but that's that's how it works with some people and you don't have to have it all figured out even when you graduate college. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Anyone else want to raise their hand? Ken, great, go ahead. So I've been out of college a few more years than uh, Megan, but uh, my start was a degree in environmental biology and interpretation. And when I was in college, I thought I was going to go into uh, environmental consulting, going and checking out a place before they might put up a building was what I thought I would do. But my junior year, one of the residents, when I was a resident assistant, uh, she she asked, have you taken my dad's classes yet? That he was teaching a course in environmental interpretation. And that's basically the course to be a park ranger and to teach at national parks and things. And when I got there, I was the only one who actually knew how to identify any of the trees or birds in the class. So it was just something that I found I had a talent for. And after taking every course that that professor had, we were out doing a field session and uh, he actually came up to me after one of our times and said, do us all a favor and go into bird interpretation. So right then I could picture that I should go work for Audubon. I did start at a small nature center in West Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, it was very low pay. I lived in apartment over a barn, but it was great experience getting to teach with lots of different age groups um, from little toddlers, which I did not ever think I would be running around with them. Uh, but also taking out adults on bird walks. So now I have a career that I did spend another eight years working at other nature centers in career, and like Diana being an environmental educator every day. And now I get to organize programs that we connect different community groups with how they can be a part of bird conservation, whether it's a garden club or a school um, that wants to have their own special area and make small spaces more bird friendly is what I do today. So, Thank you, Ken. Lori, go ahead. I'll go along and stick with the theme of uh, not having a direct path to your job. Um, I grew up uh, on a farm and always loved nature and knew that I wanted to learn more about it and loved biology and got my undergraduate degree in biology, but then wasn't quite sure what to do with it because I didn't want to go into research. And I always also loved writing and reading and the literary side. And so after just coming out of school and getting a job in business of all things, um, after five years there, I went back to graduate school and got my master's degree and decided to, um, even though I wanted to do the communication side, I wanted to make sure I really had the science side down also. And so I got my master's degree in wildlife biology, but with a concentration on environmental education and public relations. And so that allowed me to contribute to the field and do what I really love, but um, not on the field side, which wasn't really my interest. So I got to combine both writing and um, wildlife and nature, which is just perfect for me. Thank you, Lori. So I'm gonna move on to another question to uh, 
you know, keep up the tempo. And uh, it, it will allow for sort of similar answers. Um, the question is, how, how would you recommend someone interested in a career in conservation pursue a similar path as you did? Or maybe if you're someone who had a path that looked like this, you know, do you think that was a good thing? Or would you have a different recommendation? Shelby, and then Jim. Um, so I had, a, I guess, almost a little bit of a more direct path um, with a slight <laughs> deviation. I started college as like more uh, biological science and chemistry and uh, took um, a class with a professor who did environmental work and bird surveys. And I took a class with him and I really liked it. And I kind of kept talking to that professor uh, more and more. And they offered me uh, research for the summer in their lab. And so I did that. And then I kept working in their lab uh, every summer after that uh, until I graduated uh, and did research with them. And so one of my suggestions would be um, if you find something you're really passionate about when you're in college, um, if it's something a professor works on or um, a teaching assistant, like really keep in contact with them um, because they might have an opportunity for you. They might have uh, connections to give you, like to help you pass college. Um, I feel like that connection definitely helped me afterwards. Thank you, Shelby. Yeah, that's such a good point. The world of conservation, especially state by state, is actually small in a way, right? A lot of people know each other. So if you know one person, you actually know 100 people. That is a great tip. Uh, Jim, go ahead. Yeah, I guess I sort of like Shelby in that I, I had my pathway set ver very early. So I grew up in a family that was very or outdoor oriented and, and um, my older brothers uh, started taking me fishing when I was three. And so I've had a passion my entire life about fish. And, uh, and so I went to, uh, well, I had, a, I had high school uh, teachers in biology that, you know, helped me out. And um, it, it, it was sort of a mentoring, but um, not, not a great mentoring, I would say. When I got into college, I went to the University of Maine in Orono for my undergraduate degree, and I was in zoology, and I, 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 I was an undergraduate, and I, I hung out with graduate students in the zoology department in fisheries because I thought, well, these guys, this is what their their advanced degree is, and so I, I kind of hung out in their lab uh, for my senior project. I worked on a, a growing uh, algae and and zooplankton that then I fed to little tiny uh, fish to grow fish and learn how to how they grew and whatnot. And um, all I can say is the passion I had led into finding other people that served as mentors to me. So I would say, try to find a good mentor. And uh, I would also say, uh, I also had, I was a consultant in my earlier career. And uh, one of the things I did, I volunteered to um, have uh, uh, basically high school students come to one of the companies I worked at and it was funny because I worked for an engineering company and these students came to learn about engineering one day. And there were two students that, you know, then they brought them around to me being an environmental scientist. And lo and behold, those two students didn't want to do engineering. They wanted to do environmental science. So I took them out on a series of uh, field trips. And one of them ended up going to grad school at Temple University in environmental science, because I think that was all part of the mentoring. And all I would say is if you can find somebody that has the passion that helps you spark your passion, that's the way to go. Thank you, Jim. And uh, Corey, go ahead, and then we'll move on to the next question. Thanks, Sharon. Um, this is sort of a little bit in line with what Shelby was saying and what Jim was saying. But, um, you know, I, I think for me, you know, when I graduated from my bachelor's degree um, in marine biology, I actually had no clue what I wanted to do at that point. And um, so I actually just, I just ended up doing all of these sort of seasonal jobs. You know, um, I worked as a, a naturalist at uh, Mona Lake out in California. I worked at a Girl Scout camp in Alaska. Um, I um, went to Belize and hacked harpy eagles, um, but I just did all these different field jobs and it, 
uh, you know, educational jobs too. And that, that eventually helped me sort of figure out, you know, what, it, what's particular area of sort of biology, the sciences that I, I wanted to go into. Um, the other thing that I did that really helped me out a lot was I volunteered. Um, you know, because you can always find a place nearby to volunteer, whether it's, you know, for your local Audubon chapter or, um, you know, volunteering with an after school program. Um, but I, I, I did a lot of volunteering and that helped me make a lot of connections. And um, I think it was because I was volunteering for the local Audubon chapter that I actually got my first job with Audubon. So it was the fact that I had done this volunteer work and had met people and they were like, oh, we love Corey. She's amazing. Um, that actually helped me get my first job with Audubon. Thanks, Corey. Um, what is one of the most challenging aspects of being in your particular industry? Oh, Andrew Major with the quick hand. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, it's it's something that it's not only us in the environmental field, but it's trying to use science to inform the public. And then because it doesn't conform to what the beliefs that they have about the world, having them reject. I mean, you can't. I mean, we're all scientists. We use, you know, we believe in the process. And it gets very frustrating when you you show the public the data and it's not ambiguous and they just reject it out of hand because it doesn't conform to their worldview. Thanks, Drew. Diana, go ahead. I think like I, I've heard this reflected a lot that a lot of people going into conservation don't realize how much of con conservation is dealing with people. Um, I, per I, I, I'm a people person. I enjoy doing people. That's why I do education and communication and all that stuff. But um, there's just inherent challenges when it, it comes to communicating ideas to people and getting things uh, across to people. And I mean, like any challenge, you know, through at the end of the challenges, you you've made yourself more better at more adept at any skill from that but um it's definitely something that a lot of people don't expect I found going into conservation that um some people learn to love I learned to really love that I really enjoy working with people but other people are like I need to get a field job in the middle of nowhere and that's the only way for me thanks I'm going to answer my own question <laughs> um so I know that this is not just the case in communications, but I think, you know, it's just especially working for organizations that rely on fundraising, rely on grants to function. We are oftentimes teams of one or two, rarely more. And so no matter what field you're in, whether you're doing communications, whether you're doing, you know, if you're working in policy, advocacy, conservation on the beach, conservation in the forest, it's, it's, you have to be a jack of all trades, master of none. And by that, I mean, you need to know how to do the job of 10 people in, you know, your 35, 40 hour work week. So, you know, for me in communications, I manage, you know, on an average day, six different social media platforms, two different email accounts. I've got two or three different websites that I'm managing. You know, I'm working with one state to put out a press release and another state on three different event emails. And that's just, that's just normal. And it makes things really fun. Um, and it means that I get to have a hand in everything, which is really fun. And it gives me lots of different experiences, but you know, it, it also requires the right personality. Um, someone who's really a go-getter who doesn't mind things changing all the time. And, um, and I think this was mentioned before, but sometimes the pay is not great. And, you know, you have to have your heart in this work um, because you are going to make certain sacrifices. But I can tell the folks watching this webinar, at least that many people on this call have been in their fields in conservation for five years, 10 years, 20 plus years. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's hard not to have your heart in nature. Uh, so I'm going to move on to uh, probably our next to final question. Um, 
what additional education or certification is required or recommended for your career field, or perhaps what extracurricular activities could help someone develop to um, achieve what you have achieved so far. And, you know, would love to hear from anyone who hasn't spoken yet. Ah, like Rob LaFrance, thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. So um, I hear a lot of the same things I've went through from everybody else speaking tonight. Um, I ended up getting an advanced degree in law. I was fortunate enough to be able to get a law degree that was allowed me to focus in environmental law. Um, and that opened many doors for me in terms of uh, being able to work at places like the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection and other places. But my undergraduate, believe it or not, I started as a plant scientist. That's what I wanted to get into. And as a result of my um, education, I was introduced to economics. And I was one of, actually, I was hired by the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection when I first started working there as a natural resource economist. And that was a new, I was a new field at the time. And I, I guess that's my message to, to folks who are younger, who are thinking about getting into careers in conservation. Follow what, what your head tells you makes sense. I thought it made sense that ecology and economics matched up and it became a passion for me because I was able to learn about ecology. I had a great ecology professor introduced me to hummingbirds and the whole relationship between um, pollination and sort of speciation ecology. It was a great experience. And, and that drove me into the future where I ended up getting a job uh, eventually at the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, but not, not until after I got a law degree. And in between the time I got an economics and natural resource economics degree from University of Arizona and the time I went to law school, I did an entirely different thing. I was working in real estate. I was doing all kinds of different things. But eventually you come back to where you really have a passion. And, and I would say what I've heard from many folks here before is you do have to put in your time as an intern. And it seems unfair. Um, you take a low paying job. I did it while I was a law student. I worked at the department and it made a difference for me to end up getting a job there. So that's the message I have to folks is pursue your passion, follow your own brain as to where you think it will bring you in terms of what you think makes sense. And then recognize that if you're going to get into con conservation, probably going to have to spend a little bit of time uh, working as an intern or for some low pay until you get some experience. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, I just want to echo one thing you said. And, you know, I think equity in the conservation field is something that a lot of organizations are grappling with and trying to figure out how do we create jobs? How do we pay interns? Um, you know, it's changing slowly but certainly a lot of change still needs to happen. Uh, so let's do Rick and then Ken, and then we're gonna wrap it up with any final thoughts. So, you know, I was uh, listening to people who have uh, higher degrees. And when you think about uh, um, conservation, there's all sorts of jobs in conservation. In the Department of Interior that uh, I work with, there's very possible to get jobs in conservation and all you have to have is a high school diploma. Now, these are jobs that are, are uh, more blue collar jobs, uh, but let's say you kind of like nature, but you don't want to go to school, but you like heavy equipment. Well, we have heavy equipment operators. So, you know, a biologist might say, well, we need a water, water impoundment here. And so they talk to an engineer who was maybe a fish and wildlife engineer, he, he draws up the plans, then he sends them down to the people that move the dirt. And you can move that dirt. Uh, in the park service, there are many positions for wildland firefighters that don't require any advanced degrees. Uh, you can get into it without uh, going to college. So there's a lot of different uh, functions. If that's not your thing, that I don't wanna go to school, but I want to do uh, things. We hire boat operators. We fought, hire uh, uh, aircraft pilots. There are so many jobs that you can get if you want to do something else and not go and, and spend money to go to uh, college, but you want to do something, work with your hands. I've worked in a lot of positions where they're hiring uh, some of the park service places I've worked. You know, you could be a boiler plant operator, uh, but you are working in conservation because those jobs are supporting the on the ground 
work. If you don't have a boat to get out to the island because you don't have a mechanic to fix the boat or an operator, you're not going to do any conservation work on that island. So please remember that there's so many different jobs, so many opportunities that you just have to look. I would say that if anyone's interested, they should go on USA Jobs, which is the job site for the entire federal government and put in a, a job that you think you might uh, like and you'll find that they're that, probably that job in the Department of Interior. Thank you, Rick. That is such an important topic to talk about. Ken, go ahead. I was going to say something similar, that follow your passions first, that if uh, you're interested in something now, go for it. That I went on my first club walk with an Audubon Society when I was 16. And I was in a club of five that had in, that wanted to study more about the environment in high school. So it was not something that was popular to do, but it connected for me and it worked. Um, but also you see that there might be a position lists an advanced degree, but most of them say the advanced degree is preferred and years of experience it does matter. But also I've trained a lot of people who have changed careers and made a shift to want to work in the environment as well, whether it's a court reporter or a bookstore manager. And uh, our previous land manager worked on airplanes and was a mechanic on an aircraft carrier in the Navy prior to working with Audubon. So you can have your career move in different directions and it might be the craziest thing thing of what happened when you were a teen that reminds you to go back to it later. So um, you just enjoy it now. And it's the, a lot of career people I've worked with too. They all, um, they have a connection with something that happened in their family that makes them want to do what they do for work. Thank you, Ken. Um, any final thoughts? Rick, I don't know if your hand is up from before or not, but I'm going to go to I'm going to go to Megan first, and then Diana, and then if it was up, I'll circle back. Um, so this is like um, personal to what I've noticed, um, and I think that it's really cool to do. So I've kept in touch with my friends thanks to like social media and like LinkedIn, Instagram, and it's so cool to see like where they are. Um, so I have a friend who's a wildland firefighter out in Colorado. I have a friend who's getting her PhD um, in biology down in Florida. And I have another one who's working out on a um, wildlife preserve off the coast of like Oregon and doing all the stuff out there. And it's cool to like check in with them once in a while and be like, oh, hey, like, what are you doing? Maybe that's something that I'll eventually want to do one day or to send them like job info and they send me job info. So like keeping touch and kind of growing your um, like little community of like friends and of like people who love like the environment and ecology and conservation. And like through that, you kind of just exchange job notifications and you get other um, inspiration for what you might want to do. Um, so I found like keeping in touch and it doesn't have to be that often, like a couple times a year, you know, you check in with them. Um, and I found social media and, you know, technology makes it really easy these days to do that. Thanks, Megan. We'll go to Diana and then Drew, and then we're going to wrap up for the evening. Yeah, I definitely concur with what uh, Megan was saying. Uh, within uh, my friend group, I went to an environmental college. I went to uh, SUNY ESF up in Syracuse. So a lot of my friends got their degrees in the environmental field and are pursuing environmental stuff. And they are. If you go into this field, I will say any friends you make, they will just end up all over the country, um, which is really fun especially when you get to visit them, then it's extra fun. But um, I would say like one of the most important things that you can do and that you should do, and that feels really scary to do, uh, especially when you're in high school or in your early years of college, which I'm not so far away from, uh, is reaching out to people. Like you can just see from all the people here, we want to hear from you. We think it's awesome from people in high school or in the early years of college, even people pursuing, like you said, completely different degrees are interested in this field. Like we wanna bring more people into this field. There are, every day there's more sorts of jobs that people are, more combinations of things, all sorts of stuff in this field, like more than you could even just imagine, especially when you're at a young age. So 
just reach out to people, send an email. Like no one's going to be like, never email me again. And I don't like you and you smell bad. Like they're going to be like, oh, awesome. Like, I'm so glad that you like this. Like, if you're interested in this, like, you know, this organization I work with is doing like a bird walk, like by you on Tuesday, like you should like stop by. So just reach out to people, say hello, say, I like what you're doing. Can you tell me more about it? And we will make time for you. Absolutely. And to that end, I just want to say that um, I will put email addresses in the notes of the YouTube video, so any of the folks on this panel can be contacted by anyone who watches the video. And Drew, you want to wrap us up? Yeah. Um, it, you have to understand that to be in this profession actually is it's more than money. It's the experiences that you have in your life. Um, I've had some amazing all of the panel can tell you about great stories. I researched Canada links up in the Yukon Territory and I watched the Northern Lights go horizon to horizon. You could almost read by them. But I'll tell you the story that we had locally here when I was in the Fish and Wildlife Service, we were doing um, we were doing research on common, on common loons and we were up in the Rainsley Lakes in Maine. It was three o'clock in the morning. We were all exhausted, okay? The person meteor showers started across the sky. We just got done processing a loon. So the person media showers came across the sky. The coyotes started to howl. The owls piped in and then the loon that we just processed came along and just yodeled at us. And I'm going, I can't believe that they pay me to do this. It's those moments in your career where you kind of go, oh my God, you know? How, how many people get to do this like in the whole world yeah we're we're pretty spoiled all things considered well i pretty much can't imagine any better way that we could wrap this up uh thank you to everyone who joined that is that was the last set of questions that we had so hopefully Folks will get in touch with us. Again, anyone on this panel is more than happy to lead you into your career in conservation. So thank you everyone.